I've had the opportunity of sharing the word of God in the presence of some national leaders over the years that I've been in the ministry. That's a very scary thing when you're asked to speak in front of a national leader. But I want you to suppose with me and take all of the nuance out of what's going on in our world today. This is, this is kind of not normal what's happening right now, but just let's kind of get back to the normal and think with me through this illustration. Suppose I were preaching and a colleague came to the platform and handed me a note and it said, the President of the United States has just arrived unexpectedly and he wants to attend your service today. If he said that, do you know what I would do? I would take a little break from my sermon and I would say to the crowd, let's all welcome the President of the United States. And regardless of who the President happened to be at that moment, and regardless of whether we agreed or disagreed with his or her policies, If we are the right kind of people, we would stand and applaud. Why? Because we respect the office of the president of our nation. And the Bible tells us to honor the king. So if we can summon the courtesy to respect the human position, no matter who the leader might be, what should be our attitude about confessing Jesus Christ as Lord of Lords and King of Kings? The Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the concept of fearing the Lord troubles some people, but we're not talking about a debilitating kind of fear. We're talking about a worshipful reverence for God. Christians were once described as God-fearing people. Do you remember those days? Nobody even knows what that means anymore. We seldom hear that phrase, and perhaps it's because we've lost the concept of the fear of the Lord. God wants us to reverence him, to bow before him, to fear him with healthy, godly awe, for God is sovereign, and he is worthy of our reverence and our respect. There's no such thing as luck. Anything that happens to you, good or bad, must pass through his fingers first. There are no accidents with God. I like the story of the cowboy who applied for health insurance, and the agent routinely asked him, Have you ever had any accidents? And the cowboy replied, well, no, I've not had any accidents. I was bitten by a rattlesnake, and a horse did kick me in the ribs, and that laid me up for a while, but but no, I haven't had any accidents. The agent said, wait a minute, I'm confused. A rattlesnake bit you, a horse kicked you, weren't those accidents? He said, no, they did that on purpose. (laughs) Well, I need to tell you, (laughs) sovereign, is a word that means God does everything on purpose. The English word sovereign means having unlimited power or authority. It comes from the prefix sov, which means over, and it's coupled with the word reign. So when it comes to sovereign, the word means to have total control. When it comes to finances and politics, the term has to do with the nation's right of self-determination, of answering to no higher authority than themselves of being independent in their power. It's a big deal in many cultures today. But to say God is sovereign is to simply declare that he is God, elevated above the highest authority in all the universe and possessing not only infinite power, but infinite right, infinite rule, and infinite reign. He is the most high, doing what he wills with the purposes of life. He is in charge. He is the head of the armies of heaven so that no one can stay his hand or say to him, why are you doing what you are doing? To say God is sovereign is to say that he's the governor over all the nations and the commander of all history. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And thinking of God as our sovereign king and Lord answers one of the biggest questions in the human heart. And here it is. Who's in charge? That's what Winston Churchill wanted to know throughout the turbulence of the 1930s. Churchill feared no one in the British government was taking Adolf Hitler and the Nazi threat seriously. Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin seemed unable to face the challenges of leading England. And Churchill went around fuming about Baldwin's inadequacy and quoting a little poem that said, who's in charge of the clattering train? That's a question that is frequently asked today. Is there anybody in charge? 
That question determines what goes on in our homes. It has a great deal to do with what goes on in our schools and what goes on in our culture. Who's in control here? Sometimes you hear this question in the marketplace, in the workplace, and on a larger scale in our cities and in the life of our nation. Who's in charge? If we're honest, this question haunts us on a global level. I mean, not a day passes without our wanting to stand up and shout, who's in control of this clattering train? How we answer that question determines to a great deal how our lives and our future plays out. So when I say God is sovereign, I mean he's in charge of everything. He's infinitely elevated above the highest creature. He's the most high God, the Lord of heaven and earth, subject to no one, influenced by no one, independent and free in his own being. He does as he pleases, not only as he pleases, always as he pleases, everywhere as he pleases, and forever as he pleases. No one and nothing can hinder him, compel him, thwart him, or stop him. But I must tell you that while this is a wonderful truth to ponder and celebrate, there is no aspect of the attributes of God that causes more anger and stirs more debate than the teaching of the sovereignty of God. You can take a knife and cut it right down through evangelicalism, and there's a different opinion on the sovereignty of God on both sides of the mark that you make. That's why we need a strong biblical understanding of this subject. Working on this chapter, I jotted down nearly 50 key passages on the sovereignty of God, and I didn't even scratch the surface. I'll just give you four or five of them, and you'll see what I'm talking about. The Lord reigns. Let the people tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. I like that one. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all deep places. All of these verses and so many others convey the same thing, that God is in charge. He is on his throne and he always will be on his throne. He rules and he reigns in the affairs of men worldwide from history to prophecy, from sea to sea, from time to eternity. I don't know that there's any truth in all the world that should comfort us more in this day in which we live than this, that God is in control. And someone says, well, why don't we talk about that anymore in our churches? Well, first of all, we don't even talk about the Bible anymore in a lot of our churches. But this is a biblical truth, and it's at odds with what's going on in our world today. It's because this is the day of humanism. This is the era when people want autonomy and independence and the absolute right to do whatever they want to do whenever they want to do it, whatever feels good. We attend seminars that tell us whatever we can conceive, we can believe, and whatever we can believe, we can achieve and receive. If we just give humanity a little bit more time, we're told all of the ills and problems and difficulties of life will be resolved because man has become his own God. But permit me to ask a question this morning. How are you doing, sovereign man? Hmm. Is the world thriving with peace and prosperity under your so-called human sovereignty? Or is it descending into disorder and instability and chaos? Is the world cleaner or more polluted? Is it more peaceful or more threatened? Is it more orderly or more violent? Is it more prosperous or teetering on the verge of bankruptcy? You would think after all the pain we have felt as a nation, after all the hurt and anguish we have felt as a world, after all the problems we have experienced, that somebody might just ask, is it possible we're going the wrong way? We started down this path as early as the book of Genesis. When Nimrod got the people together and said, in effect, we don't need God coming down to talk to us. We'll just build our own tower up to God. We'll do our own thing. And they brought everyone together and launched their project and went to work and something odd happened. Suddenly one day they went to work and no one could understand anybody else because God reached down and confounded their language. God was in control. 
If we keep reading in Genesis, we come to the story of Joseph. As a teenager, he was abused by his brothers who threw him in a pit and sold him into slavery. They did everything they could to erase his memory. Years passed, and one day in the sovereignty of God, they faced a severe famine in their land. They journeyed down to Egypt to get their food, and guess who was handing out the food? It was Joseph who somehow had become prime minister of the greatest empire on earth in those days. But it wasn't somehow, it was sovereignty. Those poor boys thought they had been had. Here they were coming to get food and running into the brother that they had betrayed and now thought was dead. Joseph looked him in the eye and gave this little speech. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. Joseph said, you tried to hurt me. You tried to destroy me. You tried to kill me. But God was in charge, and God oversaw all of this, and he brought me to this place not only to be the savior of all of you, but to be the savior of all of Egypt because Joseph became the prime minister of Egypt and doled out the food during the years of famine. Looking at it from the perspective of history, not just in biblical days, but throughout all the history of the world, wherever humankind has tried his best to prove he's in control, he has been frustrated and thwarted again and again. Almighty God has said, I am the Lord. I rule in the heavens and in the earth and in the hearts of men. He is the sovereign God. And when I see what's happening across this country, I have to turn off the television, lay aside the newspaper, open my Bible, bow my head and say, I know the one who's in charge. The biblical teaching of God's sovereignty stirs me when I think about it. And when I look at the fact that there aren't any answers anyplace else, this is in the lap of the Almighty. And I come away with three affirmations, which I wanna leave with you to take home in your heart today. If this is true, if what I'm saying is true, what should my response be to the fact that Almighty God is in charge, that when you look into the heavens, the throne is occupied, that God doesn't go on vacations, he never sleeps, he never takes his hand off the control level. So how should I respond to that? Well, first of all, I've written down, because he is sovereign, I will reverence him. The first affirmation about God's sovereignty is this, because he is sovereign, I will give him reverence. The Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the concept of fearing the Lord troubles some people, but we're not talking about a debilitating kind of fear. We're talking about a worshipful reverence for God. Christians were once described as God-fearing people. Do you remember those days? Nobody even knows what that means anymore. We seldom hear that phrase, and perhaps it's because we've lost the concept of the fear of the Lord. God wants us to reverence him, to bow before him, to fear him with healthy, godly awe, for God is sovereign, and he is worthy of our reverence and our respect. We have tried in our culture to bring God down to where we are because we feel so distant from him. But I say to you, leave God where he is and get on your knees and reverence him. He is worthy of your respect. Amen. And because God is sovereign, my second affirmation is I will respond to him in obedience. When people disregard God's sovereignty, they disobey him. But let's reverse the equation. If irreverence produces disobedience, then surely reverence should promote obedience. When we grasp the sovereign authority of God in and over everything, from the broadest galaxy to the smallest grain of sand, we gladly submit to his will for our lives. He's the captain. He's in control. His eye scans the maps and he knows what's best for us. We may not always like the weather or the scenery or the route, but those issues pale in the brilliance of his sovereign face. In the Old Testament, there's a story about a man named Eli. He was a priest and he had two rebellious kids. 
It's embarrassing to read what they did, and I'm not going to embarrass all of you by giving you the details in the service this morning. You can find it out, and now that I've told you about it, I'm sure you'll look it up this afternoon. But there in that setting in Shiloh, where these two rebellious sons were disgracing God and their father, there was a young boy who was serving God in the tabernacle. And one evening, God spoke to this boy saying, Samuel, and Samuel said, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And the Lord gave Samuel a message for Eli, and it was not a good word. He told this young boy, go and tell Eli what I'm telling you, and this is what the message was, 1 Samuel 3. Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hear it will tingle. In that day, I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile and he did not restrain them. Wow. Eli gets this message. And you would have thought he would push back, maybe ask for grace and say, wait a minute, give me another chance. But according to verse 18, Samuel told Eli everything God said, and Eli said this, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. In other words, whoa. Samuel, if that's what the Lord said, let the Lord be the Lord. That's a pretty good sentence to keep in mind, isn't it? Whatever happens to us, whatever God tells us to do, we can simply say, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Abraham said something similar when he learned the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Ladies and gentlemen, the Lord will do what seems good to him, and the judge of all the earth will do right. We get shook up by what's happening, whether near us or far away, but the problem is our own human perspective. That changes when we remember that God is in charge. He sees everything from beginning to end, and the more we comprehend that, and the more we gladly resign ourselves to his will and obey what he says, and we come to the place where we can say, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. He will do what is right. He will always do what is best. Because God is sovereign, I will reverence him, and I will respond to him in obedience. And here we are again back to this familiar theme and the attributes of God. Because God is sovereign, I will worship him. Throughout the Old Testament, especially at momentous times in Israel's history, are great outbreaks of praise. It's truly amazing if you study the Old Testament with this in mind. For instance, there's this one dramatic story where King David was trying to build a temple in the Jerusalem for the Lord. It was the final dream of history's great visionary, and his dream was good, but God told him he wasn't going to let him do it. Do you remember that? And David was so frustrated. He said to David, you should not build me a house to dwell in, and went on to say, because you have been a shedder of blood, you cannot build my temple. You would have thought David would have gone off and pouted and given up on the whole deal, but the Bible says that David was brokenhearted, but just for a moment, he was a resilient man. And what did he do? He undertook the one thing he could do, which is always the hardest part of any building program. He raised all the money for the project. He personally gave from his wealth, and he appealed for funds from others. And then they had this worship set in the midst of that very unlikely situation. Here it is from 1 Chronicles chapter 29. David blessed the Lord before all the assembly. David who wanted to build the temple and couldn't because God wouldn't let him do it. And David said, blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. I could never have come up with something like that when I was nursing the wounds of a broken dream. 
As King David stood that day to collect that offering to finance one of the great wonders of the world, he led his people in a prayer of worship directed to the sovereign Lord. And they brought their offerings, and David said in so many words, God made you rich. And they stood that day in a moment of strength and power, and David said, God gives you strength. And they stood that day and rejoiced, and David said, God puts joy in your heart. He's the sovereign God. He understood what we're trying to learn today, that our God is sovereign, and our response is to praise his name and worship him and honor him, for he alone is worthy. Whatever I have, whatever is in my heart, whatever I've done, whatever I'm doing, God is behind it all. I have no reason for pride I have every reason to bow humbly before him in gratitude that he would be so willing to let me be a part of what he does. We are not trapped in some aimless universe spinning on a doomed planet, living in a meaningless life and dying a hopeless death. We are not riding on a runaway clattering train. Our God is Jehovah and there is none like him. He is absolute, he is eternal and all powerful and utterly sovereign. And when he reigns supreme and unrivaled as our captain, Adonai Yahweh will be your sovereign God. Things work out in our lives. Even if you got there because of an accident, God has a perfect plan and there are no accidents with God. The family you were born in was no accident. The country you live in, the language you speak, the friends you have, your weaknesses, your mistakes, all the things that you've done, your poor decisions, none of them are accidents to God. The book of Romans tells us that God works all things together for his glory, and the word for all things together is the word synergao, the word from which we get our word synergy, and synergy is when you take a whole bunch of things and put them together, and the result is much more than all of them could be added up to be. There's a synergistic effect, and when God gets involved in our lives, he takes the good and the bad, the mistakes, and all of the things we do right, and in his sovereign, he mixes it all together, and he puts it together in his plan, and according to the scripture, he makes all things beautiful. He's the sovereign God. You may think today, oh, I have blown it so much, God can never use me. No, if you've blown it, you ask for forgiveness, you get right, and you wait for God's next word, and I promise you, he's not done with you yet. He has a purpose for you. He will take what's wrong, and somehow he will weave it together into his plan, and he will make it right. Do you regret certain decisions you've made? Did things not turn out the way you had hoped? Do you feel stuck? Do you wish you had done things differently? There are no accidents with God. God in his sovereignty even overrides our sins. Maybe you're suffering long-term consequences of a bad mistake. Remember, there are no accidents with God. God is not the author of sin. So wherever we find ourselves and whatever we have to deal with, we can know that God in his infinite wisdom and in his sovereignty has designed it for our good and to make us like Christ and to bring him glory. Just hang in there. You can trust God. He's in control and he's a good God. And the wonderful thing that happens when you become a Christian is you come to the place where you acknowledge that there is a sovereign God and you realize how wonderful and powerful that is and you say to yourself, sovereign God, be sovereign of my life. Come and sit in the wheelhouse of my heart. Come and be my Lord and my Savior. And when you do that, he never ever says no. He doesn't say, I'm too busy. He always comes when we invite him, but he never comes unless we do. You don't get him by coming to church. You don't get him by reading the Bible or talking to other people or even learning the language of Christianity. You only get God when you invite his son to come and live within your heart. The Bible says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. So my plea to you today is if you do not know this sovereign God, you need somebody to get in control of your life. And God Almighty is waiting for you to invite him to be your Lord and Savior. What is there that would keep you from doing that? Why would you not want to do that when you... I heard a story once about a mother who got a call from school saying that her young daughter was ill. She hurried to pick up her child, and then she called the doctor, but the doctor's schedule was already overbooked that day. He could see the child the following morning, and in the meantime, he recommended an over-the-counter medicine to ease her symptoms. 
So the mother tucked her little girl in bed and drove to the pharmacy, bought the medicine, hurried back to the car only to realize she had left her keys in the ignition and locked herself out. When she called her daughter to explain why it was going to take more time to get home, the little girl told her to find a coat hanger. Mommy, she said, I've seen it on TV. You stick this coat hanger down inside the window, you hook it on the handle, and the door's open. Well, the mother didn't know her little girl was so street smart, but she went back into the store, and she got a wire hanger, and she made an attempt to open the door, there, and she didn't do it. She couldn't figure it out. Finally, she was just frustrated, and she, she just lifted her racing heart to the Heavenly Father, and she said, Lord God, I don't know what to do. My keys are locked in this car. My little girl's at home sick. I'm here with this stupid coat hanger. Please send somebody to help me. She finished her prayer, and his car pulled up at the curb. And the passenger got out, and the man had a rough look. I mean, he didn't look like somebody God would send, but he was there. <laughs> he hadn't shaved for days. It occurred to her that he might be homeless. But here's God's answer. So she said, sir, can you help me? What's the problem, he said. Well, I've locked my keys in this car, and I've got this coat hanger, but I don't know what to do with it. He said, lady, let me have your coat hanger. After bending the hanger and inserting it down inside the window glass, he opened the car door. Pretty scary thing that people can do that. The mother was so overwhelmed that she threw her arms around this scruffy old guy and gave him a hug. And she said to him, you're such a good man. You're such a good man. He said, lady, I'm no good man. I just got out of prison this morning. <laughs> As he walked away, the mother lifted her hands up to heaven and said, thank you, Lord. You sent me a professional. <laughs> you know, sometimes God answers prayer. Sometimes God answers prayer in unexpected ways, doesn't he? <laughs> in fact, overcomers in our warfare against Satan always deal with the issue of prayer. The passage we've explored throughout this book, Paul tells us, to put on the armor of the Lord. And then at the end, he says, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We learn those are the sayings of the Lord. And then he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this and with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now that's a mouthful. But prayer is our line of communication, our secret lifeline that connects us to our leader. It gives us his strength and direction every day. We don't get that without prayer. And this is why Paul devoted this little place at the end of this critical passage to discuss the importance of prayer. Paul slowed down, gave us a robust doctrine of prayer in 24 words. 24 words in that verse, and we have probably the most important passage of prayer in all the Bible. Let's begin by looking at the persistence of the overcomer's prayer. Notice what it says, praying always. Now, what does that mean? I mean, the Bible says men ought always to pray and not lose heart. Do we walk around like zombies, oblivious to our surroundings, mumbling mantras under our breath, praying always? No, it means we're always in contact with God. It means like soldiers on the battlefield connected to their commando with the radio, we're in touch with God. This is how we maintain our connection and learn to live in fellowship with him. If we live this way, we won't have to begin each prayer like this. Oh God, we come into your presence. No, if you're in his presence, you can't come into his presence. Lord, we come into your presence. If we live with an attitude of prayer, we're always in his presence. A vivid example of praying always is in the character of Tevi, the struggling Jewish milkman in the classic stage play and film, Fiddler on the Roof. As he works and interacts with his family and neighbors, he carries on a running conversation with God. He's, he's chatting with him like a friend. He talks about whatever comes into his head. His daughter's getting married, his lame horse his poverty, his dreams. He pauses to carry on business and take care of needs, but the moment those things are done, he's back talking to God again. It's as if his life is his prayer, and the everyday things he must do are just islands in the stream that flows continually from his heart to God. Praying always means to always be in touch with God. You know, sometimes you don't have time to get ready to pray. 
If you see a car coming at you through the intersection, you say, God help. Well, you better be in good fellowship with God when that happens because you don't have time to confess your sin and get things right when the car's <laughs> coming at you, right? So always being in fellowship with God. But it also means to pray persistently. God wants to teach us the persistence of prayer. God doesn't work on our time schedule. Did you know that for God, everything is in the eternal present? So God isn't waiting. It's all in the present. And at the right time, in the right place, for the right reason, God will answer. One of my professors in seminary was a man by the name of Howard Hendricks. He was an incredible man, known by all of the Dallas Seminary graduates as one of the great teachers of all time. My wife actually was his secretary while we were in seminary. One day, Dr. Hendricks came into our class and he said, you know, my father's not a Christian. And uh, he said, I have prayed for him every single day for 40 years. And I was in class when he came in and told me that his father was very, very ill, probably going to die soon, but that he accepted Jesus Christ as his personal savior. 40 years he prayed for his dad. It's always too soon to quit, you guys. Don't quit just because it looks discouraging. Oh, he won't even listen to us. He doesn't want anything to do with us. Just keep praying. Keep knocking on the door. Keep seeking. Keep asking. And God, God is there. God loves it when his children come knocking on his door persistently. Then notice the possibility of the overcomer's prayer. Here's what it says. Praying always. And then this little phrase. With all prayer. It's a little tiny word. The, the term has an expansive meaning. It means everything that can place in the basket. No limits, no exclusions, the entire gamut, the whole enchilada. Everything with prayer. All prayer. Praying always with all prayer. Stuart Briscoe said that when our children were small and we were trying to teach them to pray, we had three kinds of prayer. Please prayer, thank you prayer, and sorry prayer. <laughs> And those kinds of prayers, prayers of petition, prayers of thanksgiving, and prayers of confession, you can fit everything in your life. Our goal as overcomers is to be able to reach out in prayer at any moment and immediately be in touch with God. And our whole life can be a prayer as we walk day by day with him. Don't sweat the details. Leave those to God. Just pray those please prayer, those thank you prayers, and those sorry prayers. And God will hear you. Number three. The petition of the overcomer's prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. Now supplication means to ask. That's basically what the word means. Ask. God tells us that he has wired this universe to work by prayer. And prayer works when we ask. I have to tell you that oftentimes as I stand at the front of our church on occasion and people come to talk to me. They'll say, Pastor Jeremiah, I don't know what to do. Can you tell me? And then they'll unfold their story. And then I'll say to them, have you asked God about this? And they look at me like I've just asked them a question nobody should ever ask. <laughs> I, and uh, No, Pastor, that's why we're asking you. I said, well, why would you ask me when you haven't asked God? I mean, God's at the top of the list. I'm way down here somewhere. <laughs> ask God. You can go right to the head of the class. <laughs> ask God. And you know, it's a simple thing, but it's so interesting to me how many Christians there are who struggle with issues in their life and it never dawns on them that they should ask God. The New Testament encourages us to offer these prayers. When Jesus taught his disciples the model prayer to pray, he filled it with requests, not only for ideals like the advancement of God's kingdom, but for our daily bread and our personal needs like food and forgiveness and deliverance from evil. The Bible says when you pray, pray for those things. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus invites us to pray prayers without holding back, and he promises those prayers will be heard and answered. James, who is the Lord's brother, tells us our failure to place our need before God explains why we do not have peace in our lives. You have not because you do not ask. Charles Spurgeon, the great British preacher of another generation, said, Asking is the rule of the kingdom. It is a rule that never will be changed in anybody's case. If the royal and divine Son of God cannot be exempted from the rule of asking, you and I cannot accept exempt ourselves from that rule either. God will bless you when you ask. 
I remember preaching on Matthew 7 where it says, ask and she'll be given to you. Seemed like it was sort of simple, the word ask. I thought it must be some English translation of a Greek word that was much more complicated than that. So I looked up that word in all of the dictionaries. I looked it up in all of the uh, translation helps that I had. And you know what I found out the word ask means? It means ask. (laughs) That's what it means. It's a simple little word. It's a simple little word that means if you need something, ask for it. You know what? (laughs) Our kids don't have a problem with that. Our grandkids don't have a problem with that. I heard a story about a little boy who went to bed one night, and his father was home taking care of the kids. And his father wasn't, wasn't used to the bedtime routine that most moms are pretty familiar with. So his father was downstairs. He thought the children were in bed, and he could enjoy his television program. Pretty soon he heard his little boy at the top of the stairs saying, Daddy, I need a glass of water. So he goes up there, and he gets him a glass of water. A few minutes later, guess what? Daddy, I got to go to the bathroom. So he goes up. And this goes on two or three times. Daddy, I need a glass of water. Finally, the, the father had had it. He said, young man, you get yourself back in bed. Don't you let me hear your voice again. The next time I hear your voice, I'm going to come up there and give you a licking. I'm going to come up and give you a spanking. It was real quiet. Then he heard his little boy say, Daddy, when you come up to give me a spanking, could you bring me a glass of water? <laughs> I mean, you know, that's the way it is, isn't it? That's the way we are. Our kids can teach us a lot about being persistent. Amen? Amen. And you know what? They're not embarrassed. They don't have any embarrassment. God wants us to be to him as our father, as our children are to us as their father. Ask for what you need. So, the petition of the overcomer's prayer. Then let's notice the power of it. The power of the overcomer's prayer is in the next phrase, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. What power drives our prayer? It is the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. The Holy Spirit wrote the Word of God, and it's the same Holy Spirit who lives in your heart and lives in my heart. And because He's the one with the Father, because of this, He knows your intent when you pray. He takes your fumbling prayers and reshapes them to reveal the deepest needs that are underneath the surface of your words and presents them perfectly to the Father in heaven. Isn't that incredible? The Bible says in Romans 8, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. When you pray, the Holy Spirit is involved. And here's the beauty of prayer. Who is prayer addressed to? To the Father. Who prays the prayer? You do. Who's in your heart? The Holy Spirit. Where does the prayer go next? It goes to the Son of God who is at the right hand of the Father making intercession for the believer. Did you notice that the Holy Trinity is involved every time you pray? The Holy Spirit in you, Jesus Christ interceding, and the Father on the throne. Hallelujah. Well, let's talk about the precision of the overcomer's prayer. Here's the next phrase. I'm just teaching this verse one phrase at a time. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end. What does it mean to be watchful? Well, maybe it means to be awake. (laughs) Did you ever fall asleep when you were praying? (laughs) Come on now. (laughs) It's all right to be honest. I'm not telling anybody. Paul transitions from describing the Christian's armor to the subject of prayer. Notice how he retains this military imagery. He does this because we face a real enemy. To be up and awake means the battle is engaged. To be watchful means we got our eyes open. Overcomers will understand that the enemy wants to attack you with distractions and doubts and temptations so that you don't pray. So guard your prayer time. Keep your prayers constantly flowing. 
Prioritize prayer as you plan your schedule. Encourage everything that feeds and fosters your prayer life and focus your prayers as you can. Get a plan for your prayer. Don't be willy-nilly at praying. Don't just pray whenever you feel like it because I promise you, you won't feel like it as much as you should. And then prayer doesn't get done. And when prayer doesn't get done, a lot of other things get done that shouldn't get done. But if you don't know exactly what to pray for, don't avoid prayer or hesitate to pray. Trust that the intention of your prayer will be heard and understood. Here's what Colossians 4.2 says. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. And then notice number six, the perseverance of the overcomer's prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end. And it says, with all perseverance. (laughs) To pray effectively is to persevere, no matter how soaring or earthbound your prayers may feel. No matter how focused or failing or frantic you feel, the more you pray in all circumstances, the more you align your will with God's, which will mean more visible answers. And here's what I've done some days. I have it in my journal. Dear Lord, I don't know where you are, and I don't feel like praying today, but I know I am called to pray, so I'm going to pray the best I can. I'm going to do what you've told me to do, and I'm going to trust that somewhere out there you're, you're there, and maybe I'll figure this out later. Be as honest with the Lord as you can when you pray. You know how I learned that? Have you ever read the Psalms and, and seen how David prayed? I mean, he prayed honestly. He prayed, Lord, how long are you going to wait before you answer me? Someone once told me the Psalms all begin with a sigh and they end with a song. Isn't that true? You start out with David and he's in the dumps and you wonder where in the world did this come from? But he tells God what's in his heart. He prays honestly. He tells God he's struggling with his prayers. And then somehow through it all, God breaks through. We can't just stop praying when it doesn't feel right to pray anymore. I tell, I tell myself this a lot of times, Jeremiah, you got to soldier through, man. you got to keep going. you got to pray even when you don't feel like praying. Because if you don't pray when you don't feel like praying, there'll be a lot of times when you should pray that you don't pray. And that's what I'm saying. Be persevering in your prayer. And then the purpose of the overcomer's prayer. Here's what it says next. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Pray for all the saints. When we pray for each other, everybody in the body of Christ is praying for everybody else in the body of Christ. And although I may be praying for you instead of for myself, I don't need to worry about my needs being met because while I'm praying for you, you're praying for me. This is called reciprocal prayer. And Paul said, praying always for all the saints. If we all did that, we'd never have to pray much for ourselves because we'd know everybody else is praying for us and we're praying for them. How many of you know life gets so much better when you get your eyes off of you and get your eyes on God? Somebody once told me that the best definition of humility is this. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. (laughs) You know, and sometimes we need to do that to pray in humility before God. Well, let's look at the practice of the overcomer's prayer. Are you prepared to pray effectively? Do you feel confident in your ability to pray as you should? If not, don't give up. Prayer is something you can learn. You can learn to pray. I learned to pray. Professor Don Whitney of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary offers excellent advice. If you've ever learned a foreign language, you know that you learn it best when you actually speak it. The same is true with foreign language of prayer. There are many good resources for learning how to pray, but the best way to learn to pray is just to pray. Just get alone in the room and pray. Sometimes it's best to pray out loud. You won't fall asleep as easy when you pray out loud. (laughs) You say, well, I'm pretty awkward at praying. I remember one of the great things, when people get in a small group, usually somewhere along the way, people pray. Sometimes they have a time at the end of the, the small group where they have a little prayer time. And I've been so many guys, especially, who go to a small group with their wife and they never prayed out loud in their lives. And the thought of it terrifies them. 
The thought that somebody's going to put them under pressure in a small group or you go around in a circle and it comes your time and you, you don't know if you're going to live through it. <laughs> and we try to say, well, if you don't feel like you want to pray, just tap your neighbor and, and they'll pass you by. But then uh, I have to tell you, on more than one occasion, I've had guys tell me, come and tell me like they just, like they just won the Olympics or something. Dr. Jeremiah, I was at a small group last week and I prayed out loud for the first time. And I got to tell you, it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. How do you pray? You just pray. Pray the best you can. Lord, it's me. <laughs> I've heard all kinds of prayers. Lord, it's me. And it's, here I am again. <laughs> And I love those prayers because they're so honest and they're so real. They haven't learned Christianese yet, so they pray, they pray in normal terms like I think God would rather have us pray. You get what I'm saying? So here's Paul's instruction to us. At the end of the armor of the believer, after he's told us we're to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and wield it against the enemy, it's almost like he takes a step back and he says, Oh, by the way, praying always with all prayer and supplication. This is how to prepare yourself for communication with your commander as you engage in life's daily battles. You're gonna go into the war tomorrow when you get back home. You're gonna face the challenges of the secular group out there that hates God, hates Jesus, and probably doesn't think too highly of you. But before you go out into that world, go down into your prayer closet. Make sure you're in contact with Almighty God. And then you don't go out there by yourself. You don't go by yourself. You go with Him. Every week when I stand here in front of an empty auditorium and preach to more people than I ever have before in my life, I'm reminded of the incredible opportunity that God has given me to share the wonderful message of the gospel with those who watch and listen. And I just want to let you know the one thing that's burning in my heart more than anything else is that if you are watching and you do not know Jesus Christ in a personal way, before we're finished uh, with our service, you will accept him and allow him to fill you with his presence and his guidance and his friendship and his salvation during this time. I want to talk with you in this message about the perfect storm. When the Andrea Gale left Gloucester Harbor in Massachusetts on September the 20th, 1991, and headed into the North Atlantic, no one could have known that this fishing boat would never be seen again. Only a bit of debris ever turned up, and the six crew members vanished forever. In his book, The Perfect Storm, author Sebastian Junger immortalized the fate of the Andrea Gale. A film followed featuring George Clooney and Mark Wahlberg, but these stars, big as they are, played only supporting roles. The real star of the film was the storm itself a terrifying, relentless oppressor born of fierce winds and mountainous waves. It was meteorologists who named this cataclysmic tempest the perfect storm. It is just a way of saying worst case scenario. In the case of the Andrea Gale, it was the simultaneous convergence of the toughest weather conditions possible. Three deadly elements came together in October of 1991. First of all, there was a front moving from Canada toward New England and a high pressure system building over Canada's east coast and the dying remnants of Hurricane Grace, all of them churning along the eastern seaboard of the United States. Strong weather was coming from three of the four points on the compass and all of it converging on the little Andrea Gale. The last radio transmission of Billy Tyne, the captain of the fishing boat, came at 6 p.m. on October 28, 1991. He reported his coordinates to the captain of his sister ship, the Hannah Bowden, saying, she's coming on, boys, and she's coming on strong. The popular book and the movie brought the term perfect storm into common use. 
but the concept is as old as humanity. People have always had to deal with the convergence of multiple rough circumstances. Today, in our faster, more crowded, and more complex world, a few little squalls can quickly become the perfect storm. And when multiple conditions converge and threaten critical areas of our lives, such as finances, relationships, jobs, and health, we question how much more we can endure. There is really no better term available to describe what we're going through right now. This is the ultimate perfect storm. We are in the midst of this storm, and it's very hard not to feel the clutches of fear that accompany us serious storms. The fate of the Andrea Gale demonstrates two kinds of fear that we all experience. The first is that gut-level adrenaline-drenched fear that the crew felt in the midst of the storm. They were afraid because their lives were on the line. This kind of fear is beneficial. It's, it's a necessary instinct for survival. But there's another kind of fear that can immobilize us completely, and that's the fear of fear itself. Fear in the midst of the storm is instinctive and beneficial. Fear of a storm that could happen is not. It's like the fear educator William Hughes expressed in his poem. Last night I saw upon the stair a little man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. Oh, how I wish he'd go away. We need a perspective on life that takes into account the perfect storms but also reassures us that there's a safe harbor within reach. And that's where Jesus Christ comes in. As we follow him, as we, as we become his disciples, our troubles look different in the light of his goodness and his power and his wisdom. What do you do? What, what do we do when the perfect storm comes into our life? How do we manage when the winds of ill fate blow against us? Here from the life of Jesus, is a perfect storm experience that will help us understand how we can deal with the storm we are facing right now. Our lesson begins with the probability of storms in our life, and our passage is in the book of Mark and the fourth chapter. When evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us cross over to the other side. And now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. Uh, it is evening, and Jesus and his disciples are exhausted after a full day of ministry. Jesus' decision to cross from Capernaum to the other side of the Sea of Galilee is the only way he and his disciples can get away from the crowds. The Gospels tell us that Jesus was near exhaustion, and his 12 disciples were reeling from the rigorous training he'd been giving to them. The crowds had been overwhelming. Sick people, craving his healing touch, had flocked to Jesus on every street. Now Jesus was speaking near the shore of the Sea of Galilee. The crowds had begun to press in so hard that he was almost shoved back into the water, and he climbed into a boat and pushed out a few feet, and he sat down and continued teaching, according to the verse, verse 1 of Mark chapter 4. And by the time he had finished, it was evening. Desperately needing rest, Jesus and the disciples simply remained in the boat and set sail for the eastern shore where Jesus was to minister the next day. The elements of a perfect storm were gathering. I've been to Israel many times, and I can tell you from my own experience that the Sea of Galilee is like a bowl of water nestled nearly 700 feet below sea level. Mountains surround nearly every side of the sea, forming a valley and gullies that set the stage for howling winds. And when the cool air from the mountains swoops through the valleys and collides with the warm, moist air hovering over the sea, violent storms can erupt in a matter of minutes. And that's just what happened. Mark 4.37 says, A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. The great windstorm, which arose on this particular day, could be described as a furious squall. Mark, in his gospel, uses a Greek word for the windstorm that is often translated hurricane. 
And Matthew describes the storm as a great seismos or earthquake, like there was an earthquake in the middle of the lake and the shaking of the winds and, and the boat. This storm was so violent that the waves were breaking over the boat in which Jesus was with his disciples, and it was filling it up with water. And while the boat was filling with water, the hearts of the disciples were also filling up with fear. Just as sudden storms are inevitable on the Sea of Galilee, men and women, sudden storms can descend on our lives too. The coronavirus is our sudden storm. One day the sea was calm and we awoke on the next day and we were in the biggest storm any of us have ever experienced. The probability of storms in our lives. Let's notice secondly, the paradox of storms in our lives. Here's an interesting thought from this story. At this time in their lives, the disciples were just following Jesus wherever he went, yet here they are being tossed up and down by a storm and in danger of drowning. They were in the middle of God's perfect will, and they were in the middle of a perfect storm all at the same time. They were about to learn a priceless lesson, and that is that storms are not always a punishment for lack of obedience. Sometimes they are the result of obedience. The disciples were not in the storm because they had done something wrong. They were in the storm because they were just doing something right. Those men were there because they had jumped in the boat when Jesus said, let's go. So there's a paradox here. Well, they didn't do anything wrong. They're in the midst of a storm. And some people would say, how does that work? So you see the probability of storms in our lives and the paradox of storms in our lives. Let's notice third, the presence in the storms of our lives. Mark 4.38 says this, but Jesus was in the stern asleep on a pillow and they awoke him and they said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? The disciples, you see, had yet to learn who Jesus was. If they had realized the full power and authority that Jesus held, they would have laughed and shouted at the wind. In the midst of the storm, there was a presence. Some people believe in the power of God, but they're not sure about the presence of God. This was the crisis the disciples faced. They knew that Jesus was there, but apparently they still didn't realize that he was God. This meant they were unaware of God's presence. So they didn't know what Jesus could and would do. They knew that God could take control over the winds and the seas, but they had not yet come to believe that Jesus was God. Remember, the 12 knew the story of Moses and the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. They knew that God could take control over the winds and the seas, but was that same God with them here and now? That was their question. They did not yet realize that Moses God and their master were one and the same, and they truly had Emmanuel, God with us, in the boat where the storm had captured them. Incidentally, this is the only time in the Bible where we are told that Jesus slept and he did it in the midst of a fierce storm. So that night on the Sea of Galilee, an exhausted Jesus slept on a cushion in the rear of the boat with the waves crashing all about him and his disciples in despair for their lives. So we have the probability of storms in our lives and the paradox of storms in our lives and the presence in the storms of our lives. And now we come to the peace in the storms of our lives. Verse 39 says this, Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still, and the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Mark tells us that Jesus rebuked the wind just as a parent would rebuke an unruly child. He dealt with demons in the same way when he rebuked them, and the wind obeyed him just as the demons did. This incredible display of miraculous power should have quelled any remaining doubts in the minds of the disciples as to who Jesus was. I mean, the Old Testament tells us that only God has power over nature. Psalm 89 verse 9 says, You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. Psalm 107 and verse 29 says, He calms the storm so that its waves are still. And that's what Jesus did in this storm. He, he first brought peace to the circumstances around his disciples. 
before he calmed their hearts. There was a calm around the disciples before there was a stillness inside the disciples. Aren't you thankful for the moments when he stills the storm and chaos around you while your emotions are running high? Our loving Heavenly Father is kind and patient with us when the storms of life overwhelm us and fill us with anxiety. We've experienced some of that in recent days. He's gracious to show us his power even when we're beginning to wonder if he's asleep or absent, even when our cries to him for help are permeated with doubt. But we can face whatever circumstances await us with courage if we just reflect on his faithfulness and place our confidence in his great power and loving purpose for our lives. Remember, men and women, that peace is not the absence of stress. Peace is the presence of the Savior. So you have the probability of storms in your life and the paradox of storms in your life and the presence of storms in your life and the peace in the storms in your life. But let's notice number five, the purpose of storms in our lives. And let's ask the question that's in the back of many of our minds. Did Jesus bring about this storm just so he could calm it and build his disciples' faith? No, no, he didn't do that. He had no need to create new storms to demonstrate his true nature because this fallen world stirs up enough storms without him having to do it specially. <laughs> he builds our faith by using the storms that are already there. So I see no reason to believe that Jesus went to sleep for any other purpose than to catch some much needed rest. Yet he was quick to use the storm, wasn't he? As a teachable moment. The storm brought him their full attention, even as the coronavirus has brought us to attention. And the lesson would never be forgotten by those disciples, as I hope it will not soon be forgotten by us. Since we are human beings, I think I'm safe in saying that we have no shortage of storms in our lives. Not just the storm, the big one that we're going through now, but we live in a fallen world, and trouble of some kind is woven into the fabric of life. Until these storms hit, we live with the delusions of adequacy. But storms cut us down to size and cause us to fear what we cannot control. And although God does not create the storm in our life, he uses the churning seas to demonstrate his power and strengthen our faith in him. I'm a real fan of C.S. Lewis. He has a way of saying things that really help me understand. And this is what he said. He said, God who has made us, knows what we are, and that our happiness lies in him. Yet we will not seek it in him as long as he leaves us any other resort where it can even plausibly be looked for. While what we call our own life remains agreeable, we will not surrender it to him. What then can God do in our interest but make our own life less agreeable to us and take away the plausible sources of false happiness? I have to honestly tell you that what's going on for many of us now is we're sequestered and can't go anywhere and do what we normally do. Uh, we have found our life less agreeable, have we not? But if we pause for a moment and take a step back, if we examine what's really going on, we will discover what David the psalmist discovered, and that's the value of the storms God allows. In Psalm 119 and verse 67, David said it this way, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Once again, in Psalm 119, verse 71, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. David said, God used the afflictions, the storms in my life, to bring me back to a relationship with him. He said, before this happened, I was going astray. And maybe some of you would have to say the same thing. You know, it's so easy to get comfortable with our faith and then allow our faith to be pushed to the circumference of life. We go on with the busyness of our work and our family and our enjoyments and our sports and all the things that are a part of us. And all of a sudden, the God who desires to be the center of our life is barely on the circumference of our life. And like David, we'll go through something like this. And if we're careful, if we listen to our heart, if we're sensitive to what God is doing, we'll discover what David discovered. Before the storm, we went astray. But now we have come back 
to fellowship with God. I hope that is true for many of you. I've heard from some of you that that is what's happening. So Jesus allowed the winds to rage in order that his disciples would learn to trust him. And through the storms of life, our Lord teaches us many precious lessons. He reminds us of our own human emptiness, our own total dependence upon him. He teaches us to fear God with astonished reverence, not to fear the storms. We're almost finished, but there's still a couple of points left. The probability of storms in our lives. The paradox of storms in our lives. The presence in the storms of our lives. The peace in the storms of our lives. The purpose of storms in our lives. And the product of storms in our lives. Once again, Mark chapter 4 and verse 40. Jesus said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now please notice Jesus was a lot gentler with the disciples than he was with the wind. When he rebuked the wind, he only asked his disciples two questions. Why are you so fearful? And how is it that you have no faith? With these questions, Jesus reveals a spiritual truth and that is that the opposite of faith is not unbelief. The opposite of faith is fear. Belief breeds confidence while unbelief breeds fear. Essentially, Jesus was saying, why are you afraid? Do you not yet trust God whose power is present in me? In the book of 1 Kings tells us about the prophet Elijah who challenged the prophets of Baal to a duel of faith on top of Mount Carmel. From morning until noon, the prophets of Baal called upon their God to send down fire and consume the sacrifice on the altar, but nothing happened, not even a flicker. And Elijah mocked them with stinging sarcasm. In 1 Kings 18, 27, he says this, cry aloud for he is a God. Either he is meditating or he is busy or he's on a journey or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. The disciples apparently assumed that Jesus was just as indifferent to their plight, so they cried, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Elijah's suggestion that Baal might have been asleep is precisely the complaint the disciples leveled at Jesus. You're sleeping, 